Yes. So welcome everyone. My name is Wang He, I'm a new pharmacist. Started in November of last year at Moffitt. See. So we'll look at the epidemiology of the MRSA infection, understand the pathogenesis of step warriors in general, um, explain some of the resistance mechanisms, and review um, treatment options. So as you can see here, uh, from 300 clinical microbiology lab across the U.S., since 1998 to 2005, MRSA infection had increased um, either in inpatient or in outpatient. However, if you look at the data between 2006 and 2010, uh, across the U.S. hospitals, actually the MRSA colonization had increased. Uh, however, the MRSA infection had decreased with a lot of effort in antimicrobial stewardship and infection control. And by um, inpatient days of MRSA prevalence, um, it's 46.3 to 66 in 2010. So Florida sits at around 66, so it's around at the national average for MRSA prevalence. So why is step aureus so pathogenic? They are very sticky bacteria, so they like to stick to the host or um, like a prosthesis, and they like to stick to themselves and then forms biofilms. So what is biofilm? So they make, make like a matrix and embedded into this matrix, um, so makes the antibiotic penetration very hard. They produce a lot of toxins. They have many ways to invade the host system um, and destroy the host defense system. So as you can see in this picture, uh, once the bacteria enters the host at the very initial space, it goes through the exponential growth phase. Uh, where a lot of uh, binding proteins on the MRSA surface area will um, be expressed. So, for example, the collagen binding protein will help it to bind to the bone and the joint. Elastin binding protein or pronectin binding proteins will help it to bind to the blood vessels. And once it establishes itself within the host, it then it goes through the secretory um, stationary phase where it secretes a lot of toxins. So TSST1 toxin, anybody know what that is? Right? What is it? Toxic shock syndrome toxins, right? Enterotoxins and alpha toxins that cause hypotension and cytokine storms um, and a lot of inflammatory cascade. Uh, it also has a lot of vital factors. For example, um, just the phantom valentine leukocytin, which is called the PBL, can cause cell lysis, and mostly uh, found in a community-acquired strains of MRSA. And MEK-A, have you heard about MEK-A, right? So they um, encode the genes for penicillin binding protein 2A, which alter, which um, makes the penicillin um, being resistant to these isolates. So there are several different types, subtypes of uh, the MEC gene and SCC MEC type 1 to 3 are in a hospital acquired versus the community acquired strains will have a smaller type of uh, SCC MEC types and they can easily spread and they, they are better fit uh, in, within the host. Looking at the antibiotic history, so penicillin first came out in 1928 and then about two decades later. 75% uh, of the step warriors became penicillin resistant through the penicillinase production. In, in 1959, methicillin was um, pr um, marketed, and then one year later, there was MRSA appeared, and the major mechanism of resistance for MRSA was? We just make A, right? Um, which is, shows altered protein bind, uh, penicillin binding protein. And then the same year, vancomycin was marketed in 1960, and then vancomycin intermediate step aureus, which is called VISA, came out about 30 years later. And then uh, for a long time, we had no new antibiotic, and then Synercid came to market in 1999, and linezolide in 2000. And uh, for the first time, vancomycin resistant step aureus were found, um, I think, in Japan in 2002. And ever since then, there were a lot of antibiotics in the market, and especially in 2004, we had three new agents added. Um, 
So these are the current antibiotics for MRSA that are approved by FDA, and there are some agents that we use for community-acquired infections, such as septra, clindamycin, tetracyclines, but it's not, um, they are not FDA approved, and there are some investigational agents as well. So this is the normal cell wall uh, synthesis. So in the middle, there is a peptidoglycan layer, and this antibiotic will bind to the end of this carbohydrate dipeptide and blocks the transpeptidation. So what is the mechanism of this antibiotic? What is this antibiotic? <laughs> so these are vancomycin, right? This is, so vancomycin called uh, glycopeptide. It inhibits the, it binds to the dipeptide end um, binding to the alanine, the alanine portion of the cell wall precursor, and therefore inhibits the cell wall synthesis. Um, it's very active against the gram positives, and the major side effects of vancomycin. When you think about it, just say one. I'm sorry. Yes. So you have to infuse it slowly, right? And then uh, nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, neurotoxicity has been reported. So some say there is no clinical trials that actually proves vancomycin is superior to compared to the other agent. Um, so therefore, the alternative new agent should be tried. The others say the book on vancomycin for management MRSA is, has not been closed yet with a better dosing strategy and rational categorical breakpoint, um, it should be a very optimal option, um, especially when you think, uh, considering the cost of the treatment regimen. So there has been a report about vancomycin MIC creep. Um, so compared to 2000 to 2004, if you look at on the right, the percentage of MRSA and uh, MSSA isolates that had vancomycin MIC of 1 had increased from, uh, for MRSA, like from 40% to 70%. So based on this similar uh, finding, CLSI eventually um, actually decreased the susceptible breakpoint for um, step aureus. So by 2005, susceptible breakpoint was 4. So if uh, an isolate had MIC of 4, we called it susceptible. However, in 2006, we decided to reduce the susceptible breakpoint to 2. So you, now if you are MIC of 4, which is very rare to see in the United States, now it's called intermediate instead of susceptible. So by using a lot of vancomycin in practice, there are there have been like susceptible but higher vancomycin MIC isolates have appeared, or some are called heteroresistant vancomycin intermediate step aureus, which I call it H visa, or some vancomycin intermediate step aureus called visa, or vancomycin resistance goes versa. So what is H visa? So they are normally, when you just check the MIC of this isolate, their MIC is clinically detected in a clinical microbiology lab in the U.S. right now, or I don't think in anywhere else in the world, but they are mostly being detected in a, you know, laboratory study labs. However, they do exist, and uh, vancomycin intermediate step aureus um, is by um, having this cell wall thickening, and there are several genes that express uh, this cell wall thickening, and so the vancomycin cannot penetrate to uh, within the peptidoglycan um, layer and um, cannot bind to its binding site. It's, um, compared to that, for vancomycin resistance, which shows the higher vancomycin MIC, these genes um, encode for, instead of vancomycin binding site D alanine, D alanine, they encode for D alanine, D lactate side chains. So, what are those genes? 
they're <laughs> transferred from VREs, enterococci, right? Ven A or Ven B. So Ven A are more common than Ven B, like almost 99%, uh, but Ven B still can do that. So in using the vancomycin, it's a very narrowly, um, uh, it, the therapeutic window is pretty r narrow, so we have to monitor. And most commonly, we are using the trough level to monitor the drug level. So if it's a serious infection like a bacteremia, endocarditis, osteo, or meningitis, or pneumonia, then we target vancomycin level at trough level for vancomycin. Yeah, 15 to 20, right? But is vancomycin's efficacy driven by time dependent or concentration dependent? Hmm? Both. It's both. So that's why it is um, AUC driven drug. So when we say AUC driven drug, we measure AUC over MIC, and then people say um, there has been studies, so AUC over MIC has to be at least 400 for the drug to be um, reliably effective. Right. So as you can see, the AUC over MIC, if MIC jumped from 1 to 2, it, the AUC over MIC cut it in half, right? So it's really uh, much affected by the MIC of the isolates. Um, so if the vancomycin MIC is um, 1, up to 1, with the current dosing regimen, they concluded that we can probably achieve AUC over MIC of equal or greater than 400 easily. However, if vancomycin MIC goes up uh, to and above uh, with a current dosing regimen without causing other toxicities like renal toxicity, it's been um, considered hard to achieve this target. So they, uh, therefore, they came up with this um, recommendation. When the MIC of vancomycin for MRSA is greater than two alternative agents, it should be considered. So these are the alternative agents. Money, it's my understanding that, that there's a price to be paid for, in, for the organism for increasing resistance to vancomycin in terms of these alterations to the cell wall may actually um, result in decreased toxin production. Right? So, I mean, so patients who have, who have higher MICs to, to vancomycin. Yeah. Yeah, so apparently the Versa or Visa has less fitness, which means they have in vitro MICs increased, but they have less viability when it comes inside the host cell. But it, is, it still exists, and so apparently you have to follow your clinical judgment and the course of the patient's infection process. But um, based on the in vitro data, this is the rec general recommendation and guideline, but you, of course, have to use your clinical judgment. You see, like, you see less septic shock in these patients with the higher vancomycin MICs, but that tends to lead to, to more yeah. and like, longer time to clear the organism from the blood, which may lead to more secondary infections like a yeah. Yeah. So when you are using vancomycin for coag negative step, for example, their MICs are mostly vancomycin equal or greater than two, right? You've seen vancomycin MIC of two very commonly, but we target for those isolate vancomycin trough of 10 to 15 versus 15 to 20 because they are less virulent. Um, so there are some more to consider in, instead of just considering the MIC of the isolates. So the first agent, Synerseed, right, is this combination of two streptogramins, um, quinopristine and davopristine in three to seven ratio. Does anybody have experience with this drug? I've never actually used. Okay. <laughs> so what are the most common side effects you see? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my algias, uh, infusion rate reaction. Um, so they only recommend to use it in a central line, hyperbilirubinemia. Yeah, also has drug interactions um, because it's a CYP3A4 inhibitor. What if they still give it in the livestock feed? I heard that they use the Because of those side effect profile, this drug will not of favor. The next agent is linazolide. What kind of class of drug is this? And what's the mechanism of action? Right? Yeah, it's called oxazolidindion. It's a protein synthesis inhibitor. Um, it has a very broad spectrum gram-positive activities, including the VREs. 
there are dosing regimens uh, different. Um, if it's uncomplicated skin, then you can go to 400, otherwise 600 milligram twice a day. If you're switching from IV to PO linezolide, how do you convert that? One to one, right? Because the oral viability is 100. FDA indications there and resistance is mostly point mutation in a binding site and 23R RNA. Um, it has a lot of warnings, right, and side effects. So it's uh, so. What do you worry about and what do you monitor? Serotonin. Yeah, serotonin with a drug interaction and side effect wise. Cancer. Yes, cytopenia. Um, especially thrombocytopenia. Um, what else? Yeah, peripheral and optic neuropathy, uh, especially when you use it for like greater than three months. What else? Yeah, so those are the majors, uh, but in the package insert, it has lactic acidosis. For patients with diabetes, hypoglycemia has been reported, increase in blood pressure and seizure. These are the warning, not just adverse effects. Um, also, the mortality imbalance was observed in a catheter-related bloodstream infection in the original study, <clears throat> and it carries in the warning. However, if you look at this data, this is from the original study in an intention to treat population, which means any amount of drug amount was administered to the population, they were included in this analysis. So, for example, if the patient um, at the end had just a gram-negative bacteremia, they were supposed to be excluded in a primary analysis population, but in ITT group, they were included. So, if you just look at the patients with no pathogen or gram-negative bacteremia, which um, linezolide have no activity against, uh, linezolide group had a lower survival. However, if the patient, if you just look at the patient with uh, step aureus bacteremia, the survival between linezolide and control group had no difference statistically and numerically higher with linezolide group. So if you know that that's a step aureus or gram-positive bacteremia, you could use linezolide, even though the package insert carried that warning. The second agent in oxazolidindion um, just came out, right? So what's this called? Tedazolide. And it, it's very similar to linezolide in a mechanism of action, but however, because of the change in um, chemical structure, it has increased potency, so you give a lower dose, and then enhanced um, half-life, so you give um, Q24. And the study was designed with a six days of um, therapy for the skin and soft tissue infection. Um, does it cause myelosuppression? Um, Right? So linezolide had a caution on the myelosuppression, and uh, for this drug, in a phase one trial, actually dose and duration dependent effect on hematologic parameters were observed. However, in phase three trials, it was only studied for six days, therefore it has really not been shown up. For linezolide, normally when you see the myelosuppression is about at two weeks, um, seven to ten days mark. Uh, peripheral and optic neuropathy compared to the uh, linezolide group was pretty similar, but no data are so far available for greater than six days. And what is next drug showing this mechanism of action? It binds the cell membrane with a calcium-dependent manner, cause the um, intracellular ions to um, cations come out of the cells. Cause the, yeah, cause the rapid cell death, it's steptomycin, right? It's called lipopeptide. It's a concentration-dependent bacterial. It shows the rapid concentration-dependent bacterial killing. There's a dosing regimen for skin and soft, and then bacteria, bacteremia is different. Um, it's only approved for FDA for right-sided endocarditis versus left-sided. It's not indicated. And carries a lot of warning too. So, what do you worry about deptomycin when you order? Uh, yeah, CPKs, right? So, the drugs like statins, you, you want to avoid it, uh, or you get the baseline CPK and monitor it, right? What else? Yes. Is it indicated for the pneumonia, deptomycin? No, right? However, it can also cause eosinophilic pneumonia. So when you see the increase in eosinophils and um, 
other another onset of cough and other symptoms of pneumonia, you want to think about that. Um, it also has interaction with the INR and PT time. And uh, within the original study, it shows the decreased efficacy in patient with uh, lower um, renally impaired patient. However, we've been using it for quite a while. I don't know if you've seen any failure, especially in a renally impaired patient. Yeah. But that clinical practice hasn't been yeah. obvious anymore. Right. Um, yeah, so from the original study in the left-sided endocarditis, there are a total of nine patients. One in deptomycin patient succeed, and only two out of uh, standard therapy succeed. Um, and therefore, it just didn't get an approval for the left-sided endocarditis. Even though it didn't get an approval, there are people who use the high-dose deptomycin up to like nine milligram per kick uh, um, in a left-sided infective endocarditis and being successful. Next class is glycylcycline. Uh, so they're very similar to minocycline and tetracyclines, and they are very, uh, this is a very broad spectrum um, agent, right? Does it cover anaerobes? Yes, yes. does it cover pseudomonas, acinetobacter, morganella? <laughs> so there are three, uh, three P's and one M that is not covering morganella, pseudomonas, proteus, providentia, not <coughs> covered. But other than that, it covers VRE, MRSA, and anaerobes. Um, has three um, FDA indications, and its dosing regimen is pretty solid, 100 milligram, the loading dose, and 50 Q12. Uh, you don't have to adjust it for the renal function, but if you have really severe um, hepatic impairment, you have to adjust it. So I, I calculate the child food score, and if it's class C, then we reduce the dose by half. As you can see, Cmax is 0.87, which is very low. Um, so it's not really useful for the bacteremia. Volume of distribution for 70 kilo person is going to be around 500 liters. So it extensively distributes to the tissue. Carries a lot of warnings. So what are some of the things that you monitor? Pancreatitis. Yes, pancreatitis. Does it affect liver? Will you adjust the dose per liver? Yeah, it does cause hepatotoxicity. So it can cause ASDLT, alkaline plus, and all that. Yeah. Nausea and vomiting. Yes, nausea and vomiting is most um, common side effects, even though it's IV. And um, it actually has warning for the in increased mortality, and especially the patient with HAB and VAP. So this was some meta-analysis of 10 published plus 3 unpublished data. Um, you can see that the mortality on the first line was higher um, in a tetra cycling group. So it's same um, across all the different um, indications. So we don't really like to use tigacycline that much because it's such a broad spectrum. Um, if you just want to cover the MRSA, right? And it doesn't really show um, efficacy and actually shows increased mortality. So next class, these are very similar agent to vancomycin. But however, they have these lipophilic side chains. Um, and they anchor into the binding site more securely. Therefore, they have enhanced efficacy, uh, potency, and in, it has uh, prolonged um, half-life. They have a very prolonged half-life. Um, so what are these agents? Just name one. Lipoglycopeptides, right? Because they have like lipophilic side chain. So uh, at the very bottom there here, so there are some um, area of binding. So the vancomycin attached to D-alanine, D-alanine only, right? The oridavancin actually binds to D-alanine, D-lactate, which is expressed in the VRE versa isolates. The first agents in the lipoglycopeptide was telavancin. Um, it does cover uh, VRE with VNB, which is less common kind. Uh, but not for the Van A VRE. Um, you have to adjust the dose for the renal dysfunction. 
It has an indication for skin and soft tissue infection and hospital acquired pneumonia, however, just as an alternative, a second line agent. What are some of the precautions that we have to watch out? Does anybody have an experience with televancin? You? Dr. Taylor have, have not used? Okay. Yeah, nephrotoxicity that didn't change compared to vancomycin. Possibly increased efficacy in patients with renal insufficiency. With the renal insufficiency. Yeah, it has QTC prolongation warning as well. Major, interf ma major interference with the, with the coag tests. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, Patients don't like the super metallic taste they get. Yeah. So um, I, I think this drug still being studied very much in, a in vitro and animal world. Um, and you think that, okay, this will be more effective against the visa or the Ven A, Ven B isolates. However, it hasn't been really shown in those studies as well. So I think the future for this drug is pretty dismal. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay. So this just shows uh, from a package insert uh, for the HAP, 28 days mortality. When you look at the correcting clearance less than 50, telebensin group had a higher mortality, even though they didn't do the statistic test here. And also for skin and soft tissue, if it's creatinine clearance less than 50, clinical evaluation, clinical cure rate was lower compared to the comparator. They've revised the methodology for doing their MIC testing, and actually the MICs are much lower than they initially thought. So they're actually investigating using telebansin at lower doses, mm. um, and that might be helpful from a nephrotoxicity standpoint, so stay tuned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well. yeah, that's the same. The change in the methodology of checking the uh, MIC is um, applies the same to all the double benzene and Rita benzene as well. They have to add it or something else. Um, so this agent is very effective um, against you know MRSA or Visa or H Visa, but not quite reliably to uh, Versa. Especially, it doesn't cover the Van A. Um, as you can see, in a T half life is 346 hours, very, very long. Um, currently have acute bacterial skin soft tissue infection indication. It was originally developed as two dosing, um, you know, seven days apart, two dose regimen. However, recently they came up with this uh, single dose regimen of 1500 milligram one time dose. You have to adjust it uh, based on the renal function. It can be infused over half an hour. Next agent is oridabenzin. Um, so the difference between telebenzin, oridabenzin, dabobenzin in terms of coverage, oridabenzin covers the Ven A and Ven B. So it reliably covers the Versa. Uh, very long half-life of 245. Um, it was originally just developed as single dose, 1200 milligram. But because of the flavitis and extravasation possible from the agent, we recommend to give over three hours, even though they are studying it for like one hour infusion right now. It also carries a lot of warning, concomitant warfarin use. Uh, it's not really recommended or have to really monitor it closely because it affects also uh, PT, APP, and then INR. Um, slow infusion needed. Uh, some people after the, uh, during the clinical trial, some people did complain osteo. Uh, within like 10 days of this um, administration of the drug and had to come back. Uh, that's why it carries the warning against osteomyelitis. However, they, um, the authors of the original study concluded that, oh, well, it was, it's been only 10 days, not less likely from the side effect or not uh, less efficacy of the drug. Okay. You don't know the optimal dosing or advancing for us. Yeah, no, it's not studied in that population. Um, and drug interactions possible um, versus dabobenzin didn't ha carry any um, um, drug interactions in the warning section. Next agent is our uh, one and only anti-mars, not one and only, <laughs> there's a ceftobiprol, uh, but the currently available agent for anti-mars is cephalosporin. So um, for the cephalosporin is not being active against the MRSA is through the protein binding, pro, uh, penicillin binding protein 2A, but uh, ceftalidomide by attack, uh, attaching to that uh, 2A uh, PBP, it is active against the MRSA. So it is active for MRSA. Um, is it active for VRE? 
not like um, yeah, like any other cephalosporin, has no efficacy against um, enterococcus. Um, is it active for pseudomonas? Um, yeah, no. How about uh, anaerobes? Yeah, some anaerobes, but not uh, bacteriodes or Prevotella. So currently up, approved for skin and soft tissue infection and community acquired pneumonia, uh, but not MRSA pneumonia because these people were excluded from the original study for MRSA study, which is very interesting because it's a MRSA agent. Um, and currently the dosing regimen for packaging study is only Q12, but there is a study going on for Q8 hour dosing for bacteremia and MRSA pneumonia as well. I uh, just wanted to look at briefly here because this is uh, first study is CANVAS 1 and 2 study was uh, for the population with a skin and soft tissue infection. So clinic, it's important to understand how they designed the study. Clinically evaluable patient actually is the group that meet all the inclusion and exclusion criteria. MITT is an um, intention to treat group. Uh, which included any patient who received any amount of drug, so not very accurate to assess um, drug efficacy. Micro ME group is the microbiologically evaluable group, which means um, among the CE group, which is me, which had met all the inclusion exclusion criteria, they also had um, baseline isolates at the baseline. Um, then they became ME group. So when you look at the clinical success in the ME group, uh, gram negatives, if you have a gram negative isolates, um, ceftalidine group actually had a lower um, efficacy compared to the vancomycin plus minus azotreonam. And then in, if you look at here, this is from the original study, Proteus mirabilis, MIC 90 of greater than 16. So package inserts that it is active against Proteus. And if you look at actually very large uh, surveillance studies, that includes the greater than 1,000 isolate, MIC 90 for Proteus is like 0.5 or 0.25, very susceptible, unless they are ESBL carriers. However, in this study, there was only 15 patients and 15 isolates of Proteus, and it happened to be greater than 16. Uh, compared to, if you look at the azotranum arm, MIC 90 for Proteus was 0 0.06. So they were, um, they were saying, oh, maybe because of the Proteus, or because uh, it was the intention to treat population, they also included the pseudomonas um, isolates in the population as well. And that's, they say that that's why the, the authors say maybe that's why the ceftalidine arm had lower efficacy. Interestingly, in a CAP study, which was on focus one and two in America and European countries and some Asian countries, the analysis for these uh, different gram positive and negative bugs were done in the intention to treat arm instead of the microbiologically evaluable arm, which means it included all the patients that were actually supposed to be excluded from the study. So for example, MRSA infection was excluded in the major primary clinically valuable group. However, in this analysis, it's included, which makes it, you know, the ceftalidine arm looks very good, right, compared to the ceftriaxone arm. So in this case, ceftriaxone one gram was used, and then for gram positives um, on the focus one trial, gram positives, ceftalidine arm had a superior um, activity, again, compared to the ceftriaxone. Uh, versus gram negatives, it has similar efficacy. Focus 2 is a very similarly designed parallel study to focus 1. Um, no difference between the two arm. And there is an integrated analysis of focus 1 and 2, and in that analysis, they didn't present this data, which makes me wonder why. Um, and then there is another Asian studies. Those, this study only included the Asian populations. And um, ceftriaxone in this case was only two gram uh, instead of one gram. And they actually did analysis in a microbiologically evaluable group, which is uh, a fair comparison. Now patients meet all the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and the data are cleaner here. Um, and then regardless of gram positive or negative, um, it actually, the 95% confidence interval crosses the zero. So it's not statistically significantly different, but numerically higher response in a ceftalidine group. Just one thing to keep in mind is, um, like, when are you going to use the ceftalidine, really? 
unless you have MRSA and um, some gram negatives that is active against so you don't really want to use it oh so this is the end of the story <laughs> so in summary MRSA continues to be a challenging organism and there are many mechanisms of making it a very challenging organism um, understand how we dose the vancomycin um, and there are other treatment options we have to consider um, side effect profiles and the uh, indications, etc.